magnificent fish. They grow a support, reportedly up to about 80 pounds in the old scale. We don't see too many of them, well, we don't see any of them around that weight these days. I've seen probably the biggest cod I've seen would be about a 40 pounder. Today, the, the cod as it is is still an endangered species, although some of the breeding program uh, and, the, and the restocking program has put some numbers of fish back into the, uh, into the natural range and uh, seems to have been quite successful in the, in the stocking of these creeks and rivers and that where they, where they originally came from. And the fish is endemic to the Mary River system, so it's the creeks that flow into the Mary River that these cod naturally came from. I worked for Noosa Council for quite a few years. I started back in 1980 and I met this interesting old bloke by the name of Jerry Cook. Jerry owned a fish hatchery up in Timbiwa and uh, one of my first jobs working for the council was to shift some of his fish breeding equipment down to a little tin shack uh, next to a newly constructed pond on the bank of Lake McDonald. I saw the first cell division of the, of the yellow belly under the microscope and uh, literally I was hooked on fish. We bred quite a few fish out of that old tin shed and it uh, progressed that, that we needed a bigger facility, so they built a bigger hatchery for us, just up down the road a little bit further and built a few more ponds and, and everything was going along very nicely for quite a few years and, and uh, the old bloke, Jerry Cook, he uh, introduced me to another fish by the name of the Mary River Cod. I'd never seen one of these cod before or, or uh, heard of it and, and apparently it was a close relative to the, to the Murray Cod had very, very similar um, breeding requirements and, and uh, care requirements as the, as the Murray Cod. And uh, Jerry was a bit of a seer back in those days and he saw that this fish was in a little bit of trouble. So he decided that he would start a breeding program off his own back. By the end of October, early November, we net the fish, the broodstock fish, out of the ponds after they spawned. Um, we bring them up into the hatchery through the summer. The hatchery tanks have uh, got filtration and, and uh, we do a bit, little bit of water recycling and we feed the fish on crayfish and shrimp and prawns through the summer while they're up in the hatchery. And uh, they'll, they'll stay in there because the, the tanks are uh, at a temperature that, that suits them, normally around about 20 degrees or 25 degrees at the most, and well aerated, we've got aerators out of the hatchery. And um, they'll stay in there till around about March, April, and uh, we'll prepare the ponds. And um, with their spawning pipes, we put pipes in the ponds with uh, plastic liners inside, and the uh, cod go back out into the ponds after we fill them. In April, they'll stay in there through winter. We feed them up on liver, scrap fish, trash fish, crayfish, shrimp. We have a natural population of shrimp in the ponds all the time for them to forage around on and give them a bit of exercise chasing and crayfish as well. And um, when the temperature reaches around about 20.5 degrees, which is normally around about the end of August, sometime through September, uh, the cod should spawn. Particularly if it coincides with a rain event, a storm, or a full moon, or we happen to flush the ponds, fill the pond up, that's, that's a real stimulus for the cod to spawn. They often spawn on the full moon. After we, uh, we, we uh, consider that, the, that there possibly may have been a spawning, I put a wetsuit on, a pair of goggles, and I actually dive into the pond and check the spawning sites for uh, evidence that, that they've been spawning. And the fish eggs, the cod eggs, are 
uh, like little pearls that are around about three millimetres in diameter and they're very shiny and glossy and they're adhesive, they're sticky little eggs and they stick to the bottom of the, of the pipe and uh, harvest the liner out of the pond with the, with the eggs stuck to the liner. We take it up into the hatchery and uh, suspend it in a trough with some running water. Uh, the eggs prior to going into the trough have to go through a quarantine bath of formalin. From here the, the eggs go into the hatchery trough and they'll sit in there for around about up to a week to hatch out. They hatch out into a little juvenile larvae. They're cute little fellas. They look like a little blob of jelly with two little cute little eyes and a cute little tail and they just sit in the bottom of the trough for about another week absorbing their yolk sac before they turn into a free swimming little fish and we start feeding them on brine shrimp that we hatch in uh, brine shrimp hatching cones in the hatchery. Um, from this point they'll feed for around about a week in the hatchery. From that point they have to go out into the ponds. Uh, these fish stay in the pond for about eight weeks and after about eight weeks the little fellows grow from 10 millimetres up to 50 millimetres and we harvest them and uh, send them out to be restocked into the waterways. Jerry, as I said, was a little bit of a seer. He, uh, he saw that the cod was in, in trouble and the reason that it was in trouble was because the cod requires quite a pristine water hole to breed in. Uh, unfortunately, today, the Mare River isn't like that anymore. The, the creeks have been degraded. Uh, the embankments have been cleared of timber right up to the, to the river bank itself and the banks are slumping into the, into the river and filling in all the holes where the cod used to, to, used to live. And this cod requires a nice shady creek bank to shade the, to shade the creek through the summer to keep the heat off, off, the, off the river so that it doesn't get too hot. And um, he, he requires a nice uh, little, little nest of logs or, a, or an undercut bank or a, or a or a cave or, or a hollow log to breed in. And with, with the degradation that we've seen out in the Mary River, all these things are, are, are gone. You know, there's only a few tributaries of the Mary River. The Tanana Creek still, ha still has good habitat for cod. Some, some of the Six Mile Creek has good habitat. And there are a few holes in the Mary River that still have good habitat for the cod. But essentially, the habitat of the, of the fishes has, uh, has disappeared. And, um, it's probably not the cod that's quite in, as endangered as the river itself. His home is endangered. If we fix up his home, I'm probably fairly sure that the cod, if, with the protection that's, that's on the fish, his numbers would come back. The, the stocking program has, has two purposes. It's essentially a recovery action. Uh, the two purposes it serves are firstly to uh, reintroduce cod into parts of their former range and enhance populations that, that did still exist in the early 80s in the Mary River and its, and its tributaries. The second reason was to provide a mechanism whereby recreational anglers could continue to target cod and, and even harvest them um, if they wanted to um, by creating fisheries outside of the Mary River catchment and when the stocking program commenced um, there was a a bag limit of one introduced at nine impoundments where stocking was occurring and cod were maintained as a no-take species in all other areas to protect the species. The Queensland Government and the community started stocking as I said in the early 1980s. It wasn't until 1994 that the species um, came to the attention of federal authorities and efforts uh, commenced to develop a recovery plan under federal legislation and it wasn't until the year 2000 that that program was officially adopted under the uh, EPBC Act. So the stocking had, uh, had been going for quite a while before the recovery plan officially endorsed it as a recovery action. 
Fingerlings are stocked into the Mary River and its tributaries with the um, exclusion that there's no stocking taking place in the Tanana Kundu area. Um, over time in the Mary River catchment and its tributaries there's been around 300 to 350,000 fingerlings released. Um, a lot of those have gone into Lake Macdonald um, but certainly there's 35 sites on the main river channel have received fish and 22 individual tributaries. And there's also been stocking in Lake Barumba and um, Baroon Pocket Dam. Outside of the Mary River uh, catchment, there's stocking into the uh, Stanley Brisbane catchment, into the Logan Albert, um, into the Narang River, Canungra uh, Creek, and, and a few other smaller waterways down that, down that way. And um, some of that stocking occurs into flowing rivers like the Logan Albert, uh, but there are certainly nine dams in the southeast Queensland that are specifically stocked for creating and maintaining recreational fishing opportunities. The Mary River Catchment Coordinating Committee has been uh, formed for, since 1993 and it was actually formed in response to a series of significant flood events that created considerable damage to the river from Conondale in the south to Meribah in the north. And um, the, the group is composed of 25 uh, sector representatives um, ranging from beef, dairy, horticulture, land care, environment, and then just general com community mem members as well. Um, and they meet on a six weekly basis, generally in Gympie, which is, Gympie's the centre of the catchment. And um, they discuss integrated catchment management issues um, during those meetings and then plan as well. And the other thing, the other aspect that we do is we obviously do considerable amount of on-ground work as well as the planning and um, we, we've been focused a lot on riverbank restoration and, um, and not just riverbank restoration but the creeks and tributaries as well, rehabilitation of those, creek, uh, those areas as well. Um, since 1995 there was a grants program started to devolve funds out to landholders to do, to take on rehabilitation of the riparian zones. Um, another focus that we've been taking on in the last uh, 10 years, I'd say, is um, threatened species um, management, habitat enhancement, that sort of stuff. So really focusing on the Mare River cod and the Mare River turtle um, and some of the endangered stream frogs uh, that occur in the catchment. The Mary, like Nearly every other river in southeast Queensland suffered at the hands of a lot of human impact over the last couple of hundred years and is you know, re recovering from a lot of that and there are still a lot of pressures um, ongoing. So this country through here would have all been scrub country, in fact it's marked on a lot of maps as impenetrable jungle. And the Mary's a bit lucky, it's still got patches of that scrub along uh, its banks but you know, most of that's gone now. And the sort of impacts we've had, uh, there's mining impacts from sand mining, uh, there's been sand mining in stream, just upstream of here. Uh, pollution from gold mining, is, Gympie's a very well-known gold centre. Um, basic just over-clearing of a lot of the land, uh, clearing of the riverbanks, collapsing of riverbanks. Uh, general nutrients coming in from farming, uh, and uh, urban sources. Uh, so there's all these pressures have been on the river. Um, for the Mary Cod, one of the major pressures uh, early on was massive overfishing. The cod were dynamited out of the river and used as pig feed and that sort of thing. So this river was teeming with life and it's really suffered a fair bit. And so a lot of people are working pretty hard to bring it back. Uh, it's, we're lucky enough that a lot of the critters are still here. We haven't lost um, some of the species like we've lost in other rivers and so we're working really hard to keep those, uh, those species on track here. Uh, one of the things that a lot of people don't think about are the plants that actually live in the river and they're really important um, for, for a lot of the animals that live here that, and uh, so it's imp important to get some of these native macrophytes 
and, and look after these in the river. We've lost a lot with scouring and the floods, but um, one of the threats to the river is actually introduced uh, water weeds coming in, and we've at times had phenomenal problems with water hyacinth, salvinia, ageria, a, a whole range of introduced weeds coming in, colonising here, and really interfering with the water quality and the the, uh, the chemistry of the water in terms of oxygen. So that's been really important for cod. When times get tough and we get these big weed infestations, um, we've had we've had it getting so bad that it depletes oxygen and um, and has killed cod. Uh, but this one here is one of the really important good plants to have in the the river. This is young Vallisneria starting to re-establish, and this is really important. Um, particularly for things like lungfish. And the other thing about the river is that there's lots of critters in here. Everything's connected. Everything's all together. So actions that we take for cod can benefit other critters. Actions we take for the health of the river whole benefit the way everything works together, not just cod. So Mary's really interesting. It's got lots of interesting critters, even things that people don't think about much, like these big uh, New Holland freshwater mussels. Um, there's a whole range of things living here. We understand very little about how the whole system works, so we're better off looking after the whole system, not just focusing on one critter like cod, as important as it is. The fence that we've got here is, um, is absolutely critical to this sort of project. And even if we weren't um, removing camphers and doing reveg, even just fencing on its own is an important first step um, to looking after the creek banks that are further down there. So we've got cattle on this side, which are too shy to come up and say hello at the moment, which is unlike cattle. 